as a catalyst in connecting, we're really excited to have Arnie Bellini here, um, the CEO and founder of ConnectWise, to share about innovation in IT organizations. Thank you. Good morning. As you can see, I have been to the east. This is my wife. Uh, <laughs> so we just got back. And I have to say, um, the Indus Entrepreneur Group, you have a very important mission. Um, I have never been to your country before. And I was amazed. I was amazed at the people. I was amazed at the progress. I was amazed at the new prosperity that I saw in various regions of the country. I was amazed with the education. I was amazed with the innovation. I love Modi. Uh, and I just, I saw so much hope for that country. And you know, I love talking about innovation and technology and what I realized is that this is a country that absolutely is going to rely on technology to thrive and even to survive. 1.4 billion people, it's about 1,050 people per square mile. Um, adding 12 million people a year to that country. If we don't have scalable education, scalable health care, uh, scalable agriculture, if we can't scale all of those things, if we can't metamorphosis and completely transform transportation, the world has no hope. India has no hope. Um, so it has to happen. So this isn't a, oh, doomsday. This is like, oh, good, then we will do this. So I have some really good news for you. It's, um, and I think that, you know, I, I want to share one other picture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we happen to be there at Holy. Um, I, I guess I would say I will never be the same after Holy. Uh, <laughs> only because I can never get that, all the pink stuff out of my ear. Still coming out, you know, two weeks later. Uh, but, you know, again, what a wonderful experience for me. So I guess before I really get going too far into my innovation speech, I wanted to say this to you, those from India, those of Indian descent specifically, um, do not lose what you have from your country. Uh, do not lose what you brought to this country from your country. Uh, so I would say, you know, the West has half of the answers. The East has half of the answers. Together, we would have all of the answers. Um, so I think that is really incumbent upon you from of Indian descent. Um, I'll worry about Italy, uh, along with Santo Canone. We're Italian. Uh, I want to help out with India. We're making an acquisition in India uh, that we think is going to be very instrumental here for the Tampa Bay area. Um, so, you know, I guess what I would say is that, you know, if you look at Tampa, it's going to look uh, a lot more like this as we get going. I mean, innovation is just changing the entire landscape of our city, but more importantly, it's changing the landscape of absolutely everything. So, you know, you think about transportation and the future of transportation, uh, highways with no drivers, zero totally autonomous. Um, you know, people talk about Tesla, and you start thinking, it's like, wow, Elon Musk, and he is an amazing entrepreneur. I guess I would say, also, if you're looking for a real exemplar, someone who you can really say that person has it right, it's, it's very dangerous to give anyone that credit, but I would say Elon Musk is that person. And the reason is, is because he's completely transforming uh, everything about transportation. It's not really about creating a brand new automobile. It's not about that at all. It's about completely revolutionizing transportation and the way it's been thought of forever. So it's not a new car. 
Uh, it's a new complete autonomous driving system. Okay, I have a Tesla. I can tell you, they know where you are. They know how you use their vehicle. Now, I'm not, let's not get into privacy laws and all of that, okay? But realize that it's a completely cloud-based solution that happens to have wheels, okay, and can happen to take you to places, okay? Every car that's rolling off of the line now is fully autonomous with all of the sensors, everything necessary, okay? So when you think about transportation, realize that it's completely being changed, it's completely being overhauled, it's completely being rethought. There's no reference to the past, including how it will be fueled, okay? Energy is another battlefront that is completely changing. Uh, you know, we think about energy, you know, this, does this make sense? This is 200-year-old technology, coal-burning electric plants, okay? That, oh, by the way, they burn as much coal as they think they need to burn to produce the electricity that they think they need that day, but if they get it wrong, there's brownouts and blackouts because they didn't put enough coal in the bin. And if they get it right or, or, or over, over, over produce electricity, it just gets wasted. Okay? It's a completely inefficient system. It makes absolutely no sense. It's polluting our environment. And the predictions are that, and, and the stats are very simple. So you want to talk about an industry that's being completely overhauled, energy, right? Why? It takes 14 cents per kilowatt hour to produce a coal plant, uh, and so it only takes 11 cents for solar, 11 cents. And that price is going down because technology is driving it down, right? To the point where we even have tiles on the roof that can be solar panels, okay? And, and harvest natural energy that we get every single day and I think the cool thing is, is that, you know, if you looked at solar energy worldwide, you'd only need about 440,000 square miles, about the size of Columbia, uh, to, cut, to take care of all of the world's power needs. Not some, every bit of power consumed every day would only need to have this much of the surface of the earth covered so that we would have 100% renewable clean energy. So it's not a matter of when, Okay, it's, I'm sorry, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when we're going to get there. Okay, when will we get there? When will you help us get there? When will entrepreneurs and innovators help us get there? There's a whole world of opportunity in all of these areas. In fact, every industry, every business, every economy is rethinking how they deliver their goods and services because everything is up for grabs now. Uh, and the last one that I really love talking about is artificial intelligence. Did you know that artificial intelligence, the predictions are that it'll reach human intelligence. The 350 experts are saying that it will reach uh, human intelligence by 2060, okay? I will just barely be alive. So good luck with that, <laughs> okay? There's those that think that artificial intelligence will usher in the Terminator. There's those that think that artificial intelligence will usher in the world of the Jetsons, okay? I believe it'll usher in the world of the Jetsons where all of technology and all of uh, intelligence is at the service of humanity, not the other way around, okay? Uh, you do have a lot of people very concerned about it. Again, Elon Musk is weighing in on this and saying, if you don't get ahead of this thing, it's gonna get ahead of you, all right? It was funny because I spoke at the Innovation Summit and I talked to Bernie, the Chief Information Officer for uh, IBM backstage, and I, we were talking about this artificial intelligence, and I said, hey, you know, that could really go wrong. You know that, right? He goes, yeah, don't worry, we got it under control. You know? <laughs> and I said, really glad to hear that IBM's got it under control. I wonder, and I looked at him and I go, God, I wonder if Putin's got it under control. Gee, I don't know. Um, <laughs> My point is, is this is extremely powerful, uh, very powerful. The fact that this is happening, and don't think it's not happening, it's happening in everything that you do. Who has an Alexa? Who's got an Alexa? Come on. Or a Google Home, okay? You've already watched them go from pretty stupid to, hey, they can answer a lot more questions. 
It's using everything that you feed it and every mistake that it makes to figure out the right answers, okay? It's only going to be better and better and better. Artificial intelligence is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It will aid and abet us in many ways. Again, another major opportunity for everybody to be able to take advantage of all of these innovations with whatever you're doing in your business, right? But it is no matter what you're doing in your business, it's absolutely important for you to understand that these trends are happening. These are mega trends. These are macro trends. These are driving hard and fast. And you got companies like ConnectWise in town who are doing everything we can to try and move that forward, all right? Why are we trying to move that forward? Well, we think that it's probably the very best hope for the future. Here's the last thing as far as technology to kind of really get your brain going on it that I want to point out. There's going to be 100 billion connected devices by 2030, OK? If you look at the population of the world, we're cruising along, adding about 80 million people a year. We'll be at about 8.4 billion by 2030, OK? Uh, but this is how fast connected devices are growing, OK? It's way outstripping the population. In fact, 100 billion devices by 2030, anything and everything. That means anything and everything. That's not just talking about your watch on your hand or your phone. It's talking about sensors in the highways and bridges that are figuring out stress points and reporting back before bad things happen, okay? All capable, all possible today. A uh, good way to think about it is uh, by 2030, there'll be 12 connected devices for every human being on Earth. That's kind of an interesting stat, isn't it? Okay, that'll just give you an idea of how many, how many. We don't even have one per person on Earth right now, okay? So this is just gonna be an explosion of devices. This is the internet of things that you hear everyone talk about, okay? It means everything. So that's gonna change quite a few things as well. A Little bit about ConnectWise, uh, our whole mission is to create technology success with our software platform. Um, I like to present this because it gives you the whole company in a snapshot. You know, our real why is, why do we do what we do? It's really because we think technology holds the greatest hope for a better future, right? And I can't tell you, but my trip to India absolutely made me realize that more than anything else. Uh, that, wow, we got to get busy. We got to get to work. We've got to get clean energy. We've got to get, you know, better transportation. We have to use Technology and agriculture. We're not going to be able to feed everyone if we don't. And we've got to do the same thing in healthcare and education. Um, but this is us in a nutshell. I guess people look at this and they go, oh my God, how did you do that? Sansa was right there with us, you know, in the early days. It's like the answer is there's no, no day you wake up and you go, that's it. I'm done. I made it. Okay. I didn't wake up today saying, that's it. I'm done. I made it. Okay, yet the company's worth $1.2 billion. You're never done, okay? You're never done. You know, the thing I guess I would say to you is that, you know, success is really a journey, and success is a philosophy. And if you really want to be successful, this is the hard part. If you really want to be successful, it has to be for all the right reasons. This is where the East should come in for you. This is where your history and your ancestry should come in for you because they do understand uh, the mystics from the East, you know, the spiritual leaders, they do understand what we should do with all of this. It cannot be to make you a rich man or a rich woman. That's not the purpose, okay? You have to have a bit of a nobler purpose. And if you don't, you won't be able to get up in the morning, not every single day, because you're chasing uh, profit, you're chasing wealth, okay? You're chasing something that's not sustainable. So I do not get up every day thinking, oh my God, if the company's worth 1.2 billion and I own 50% of it, what does that mean? I don't think about that, okay? Um, actually, I do. I think about that and I think, God, when that turns into cash, I'm gonna have to give that away, right? I'm gonna have to find a way to give that away, right? Uh, so I always like to think of it as in three stages of your life, you know, so those of you that are very young, you're right now, you're learning, right? Uh, if you're in school, and this is where I got my MBA, I learned so much here, I credit a lot of my success to what I learned here, learning. Next phase, earning, 
Okay, we're all busy doing the earning part. Don't forget the last part because it's the most important part, and that's returning. All right, where you've learned, you've earned, and guess what? You return it because everything is a cycle. Right? They teach us this in India. They teach us this in the East. Um, uh, everything is on a cycle. Nothing is without a cycle. Okay. Learn, earn, return. It's very important. I don't think there's anything special about us, honestly. I think there's a few things that we've done that a lot of people don't do, and I think that we've really focused very hard on culture. Culture, to me, is probably the most important thing. You know, culture, to me, I, we're Italian. We started the business like a, a family, right? I mean, it's just been a large, growing family at this point. Uh, we've always treated it that way, but culture is a very important thing to us, and we really do a big, big bit on advertising our culture inside of the company, making it scalable, making it known, actually living by it. Uh, your culture may be different than our culture, but we try and make it as simple and easy as possible, and we like to have graphics for it. Uh, and you know, obviously, I could double click on any of these and give you the detail on it, but this is the high level, okay? Uh, we think it's really important to listen to your people, uh, your voice, your company. We think it's really important to deliver on what you say. We think if you're not loving what you do every day, go find something that you do love because it's your passion and your energy and your enthusiasm that makes a company great. And if it's not being brought uh, by you at this company, then it, look, let's help you find a company where you will have that, uh, that passion, that innovation. Uh, Innovation is another huge part. It's not one and done. I can't tell you how many times we have reinvented ConnectWise. All right? Uh, Santo was our chief operating officer for a number of years. Thank you. You got me out of a lot of trouble uh, when I was having operational nightmares. Uh, he did an amazing job. But the company that we are today, I think Santo would walk in and go, it's sort of the same, but it's a totally different company. You have to continuously reinvent yourself and innovate. Uh, it is an absolute necessity. Why? Because of everything that I just showed you. It's like technology is just ripping through every industry, every business, uh, every economy, and completely transforming it. You can either get be, you can either say that's terrible, it's changing the way things were, or you can get in front of it and then use it uh, and may, be transformative with it. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to innovate. Um, I use this example, and it really is, you know, true. It's like, you know, the Tampa Bay Lightning are a great example of innovation. Why? Because they've got five players on the ice that are very quickly moving around, trying to figure out where the puck's going to be, right? They don't skate to the puck. They skate to where the puck's going to be. That alone is innovative. You cannot skate to the puck. You have to skate to where it's going to be. You have to consider all these technological changes that I talked about and say, where will my business be? What does that mean that I can do different and unique that might give me a competitive advantage? Or as we call it, a commercial insight, something that makes you completely unique and different. Lots of opportunities to do that. If all of those players are not on the ice innovating and trying to be as uh, fast and innovative as possible at one time, they're not going to go any further in the Stanley Cup. But I think that this, this team has got a really good chance because I see a ton of innovation. You know, the other thing that's really great about uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning is, you know, it's not, it's not like they just go out there on the ice and they just start skating around. They have a plan, right? So they have a strategy for that as well. Innovation is super important. Strategy is very important. Strategy is not. Now, this is where I will come to you uh, with an Eastern thought. Here's strategy in the East. I'm not making fun of you. I'm not making fun of you, but I'm just saying you're spiritual holy people there. You know, it's like some of them think they're going to get it divinely from God, and then they will simply deliver it uh, to the masses. If you as CEO feel that is your job, you got it wrong, okay? You do not figure it out. You should not figure it out. You should let your team figure it out. And here's why, because strategy is something that has to be completely dynamic, okay? Here is our 2018 strategy. First of all, it's not a secret. We market it throughout the company. 
We do campaigns to make sure everybody knows it. We have 1,000 colleagues, okay? It doesn't just automatically happen. Strategy automatically happens in small companies. Culture automatically happens in small companies. As your companies grow, you will have to find a way to sustain it. So if you want to understand the success of growing bigger, it's really simple. Don't lose the amazing things that you have when you're small. Don't lose those. Those are the real precious gifts. You are agile. You can figure anything out very quickly. You're a small team. Culture just automatically happens because it's just the 10 of us, or it's just the 15 of us. You can stretch that all the way to it's just 150 of us. Once you go past that, you have to make it scalable. You have to do it in a more deliberate way. And strategy is also that way. So you have to have a way of harvesting the strategy from your team. There's lots of very simple processes that are documented that you can take classes on. One of them is the Peterson, uh, Peterson uh, Stratops is what they call it, okay? It's what we follow. It's amazing, okay? You know why? Because as CEO, I used to, I used to do this. I used to leave myself, I used to block myself out for a week and go, what are we going to do that's going to be unique and different this year? And I would come up with a strategy and I would deliver it, okay? And we did okay for a while like that. That's not sustainable. Number one, I'm not that smart. Number two, uh, I don't want that pressure on me, neither do you. And number three, you can get so much better information and ideas and, 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 and thoughts from your own team, from your own management team, in fact, from the people who are in the grassroots doing the work. Go find a process like StratOps that gets the strategy from everybody that's down in the trenches doing the work, which you are not necessarily that person, right? Okay, therefore, do not think that you understand what should be done in your business, okay? Consult with those. Get everybody to put their ideas in. That doesn't mean you have to do it, but you know what? It means everybody's been heard, and you know what? When everybody's been heard, even if they don't get their way, pretty amazing. How many of you have kids and you went, hey, who wants to go to Disney World or Disney, uh, Disney World? I've had that conversation. There's always been like three kids going, yes! and one going, no way, I don't, don't want to stay home, right? You've had that, right, okay? That kid's still going to Disney World, okay? And we're gonna try and make that kid happy, okay? Um, and it's the same way with your colleagues, right? It's like, yeah, we're all gonna go, and it's pretty interesting, because if they weigh in and they say, I don't want to go, it's like, but then you say, yeah, well, we kind of all voted and we're going, so make the best of it, okay? Uh, it's amazing how you can get your company aligned. I think the alignment is the most important thing. And then if you've got all of that, right, if you've worked on your culture, if you're, if you're allowing your teams to innovate, right, if you're farming the strategy from everywhere, you're automatically going to get enthusiasm. Now, enthusiasm to me is the most important thing, okay? Enthusiasm is... Uh, is body language. You can tell. It's, it's not something that you're going to be able to, hey, are you excited? It's like, of course you're going to get the answer you want. You're the CEO, right? You're the owner. You're, yeah, I'm really jacked up, boss. Um, you know, that's what you're going to get, okay? But you can see it in their body language. You can see it in the way that they have excitement in the meetings and when you're talking about what you're doing, okay? Uh, enthusiasm is huge. Um, I always like telling this story. I'll tell it very quickly because I know my time's running out. But we went to the 19 uh, or 2006 national championship. I got my MBA here at USF. Um, I got my undergrad at University of Florida. I am a Gator. I am a Bull Gator, actually. So I'm a Bull Gator. Um, I came to USF, by the way, because the computer curriculum was so much more advanced than the University of Florida, by the way, okay? Uh, and uh, the focus on entrepreneurship was so much keener here at USF, so it was a beautiful place to come get an MBA. So we would go to the national championship game. It's out there in Tempe, Arizona. It's against Ohio State. My wife does not like football. She comes to the national championship games to watch the cheerleaders, and that makes her happy. Um, and if I'm lucky, she'll, she'll stay awake the entire game. But what she is very good at is people and body language. And she looked across the field, and she goes, oh, well, we're going to win. And I went, oh, and 
you don't ever watch football. I know all the stats. I mean, you've, you've, did, you, did you look at all the stats and everything? No, I'm just looking at the players, the Ohio State players, they're flat. I said, what? She goes, yeah, yeah, look. Look at the Gators. Look at all the Gators. They're like, ah, da, 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 da. They're jumping around. They're all excited. And look at the Ohio State players. They look nervous. They're like, oh, walking around. You know. So the first play of the game, if you guys remember the game, the first play of the game, uh, Florida kicks off to Ohio State, Ten Ginn, Ted Ginn Jr., right, you know, Heisman Trophy candidate, you know, gets the ball, runs it all the way back for a touchdown, okay? And I look at my wife, and uh, the Ohio State guys uh, are on the sidelines and just piling on Ted Ginn, all just like all excited. I'm like, whoa, what about that body language? She goes, that doesn't matter. She says, that was one thing. What they came to the beginning of the game with is how the game will go. And I'm like, oh, she's really going out on the line. I don't, well, she was right. Okay, Florida decimated Ohio State after that because it didn't matter about that one first score. It mattered about everything after that. It mattered about how they prepared. It mattered about how they came to the game. It mattered about their mindset that they were prepared to deliver, okay? And not one event was going to stop them, scare them, or prevent them from having success, all right? Enthusiasm is very important. So I would leave you with, if you, you want to foster enthusiasm, you want to be the cheerleader in your companies with your people, you need to have a vision it cannot be, I want to be the best or most profitable HR company in Tampa Bay. That's a goal for you. That's not a goal for humanity, okay? And ultimately, if you don't go to, really, how will my business, how will what I do every day help humanity? If you're not answering that question, you'll never get true enthusiasm uh, not the sustainable kind that you want. You want to be able to answer that question. That, combined with your culture, combined with a, an environment of innovation uh, where strategy is constantly farmed from everyone on that team and they know it, you will get your enthusiasm, you will have your success, you will be just like I am, you'll turn around when you're almost 60 going, I don't know how that happened, but we sure have created a really amazing company right here in Tampa Bay. And then the last thing I'm going to leave you with is everything, and I mean everything that you need is right here in Tampa Bay. The talent, the funding, everything that you need is here. I have never thought once about picking ConnectWise up and moving it anywhere else. There was never a reason, okay? I always felt like I was so blessed to have the opportunity to start a business right here in the Tampa Bay community uh, and so we're looking forward to employing a lot more people. And if we have our way, we're going to bring Silicon Valley to Tampa Bay. So thank you all very much for your time today. I appreciate it. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Kaushal Chari. So Arnie, if you uh, are missing Holi uh, and you like to experience Holi next year, please let me know. Okay. We will uh, provide that experience right here in Tampa Bay. <laughs> and remember, we will use colors that come out very easily. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for reminding those immigrants from the East uh, of their heritage and that they need to preserve and bring that to the table to work with the West to make a better society. And that's a great message from Arnie. Um, thank you for uh, uh, sharing with us uh, your views on innovation and the, uh, sharing the landscape on innovation, uh, particularly opportunities in transportation, in uh, energy, uh, in artificial intelligence, and in IoT. And I think uh, these are some areas uh, that uh, are going to flourish in the future, and uh, so these, uh, please, entrepreneurs, take note of that. Um, talking about culture, uh, I fully agree, Arnie, that culture is extremely important, uh, and I will share with you, uh, I had been to ConnectWise when it was on Bush Boulevard, 
And one of the easy ways to gauge the culture of the place was to uh, have lunch there. And Arnie would cater lunch for all his employees. And they would have gourmet meal for everyone. And that was really impressive. That really brought everyone together as a team, as a family. And so I cannot, uh, you know, that was one of the best practices uh, that I saw. Can I, can I add yeah, something yeah. there? Well, just funny story on yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, so we actually advertised, there is a free lunch, right? And we actually advertised that for recruitment. It's like the, the home of really the free lunch, okay? So the IRS caught that. <laughs> yeah, the local IRS agency caught that on our ad. They said, hey, wait a minute, I wonder if they're treating that as income to their colleagues, because if they don't, then we got some taxes coming our way. So they came in and they pulled an audit on us, and uh, turned out they pulled an audit for 2013, 2014, 2015, three years, okay? And they got in there and they dug in on that free lunch thing really hard, and they figured out at the end that we owed them $50,000, um, which is not very profitable for them to waste that much time, but, but, uh, we always pride ourselves on doing everything right, and so we actually saw some anomalies in our own way that we were reporting taxes, and we started digging in with the IRS during the audit. Turns out, by the end of the audit, they wrote us a check for $2 million. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I am the only CEO in the Tampa, or probably in the world, that invites the IRS to do an audit every year. <laughs> so, <laughs> so one of the questions that will arise is, how do you scale uh, scale this? You know, this lunch thing. Uh, you know, Bush. When your office was uh, in Bush Boulevard, uh, there were not that many people. Now you have what, 750 or? Uh, thousand, I don't know how, so how do you scale that? Uh, well, you have to outsource it at some point. Uh, okay. So we were bringing all the food in, and then, so what we did is we, we actually, when we got our new space, we went to the landlord and we said, look, we'll take 75,000 square feet, but, you know, you gotta put a cafe of some sort in the building, and so they were nice enough to do that, and that's actually, they're very happy about that. They're putting it in every one of their new buildings now because they've realized there's such a massive benefit with that, so we outsource that, yeah. So that was about culture, strategy, and, and, and thanks, Arnie, for reminding us that uh, strategy is a team sport and that uh, everyone is involved in that. Uh, and then finally, uh, enthusiasm. You know, you can see how enthusiastic Arnie is and when you go to his uh, uh, ConnectWise and you'll see that enthusiasm uh, among his employees, you can, it's very evident. They are so excited and ready uh, to deliver you know, what they're supposed to do. So um, I, I would like to um, also share with you that uh, uh, Arnie is uh, one of the very rare entrepreneurs in the Tampa Bay area who has founded uh, Unicorn, Tech Unicorn, in, in the Tampa Bay area. And he has, uh, 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 you know, uh, very, very few companies uh, are Tech Unicorn here in Tampa Bay area. So, and I'm very delighted to know that he's going to stay put here. Uh, and uh, a leading question would be, uh, what would it take uh, for Tampa Bay uh, to have more tech unicorns? How can it uh, uh, attract more companies and someday be like Silicon Valley? Well, Silicon Valley started, I don't know, is this guy still alive? This is still alive, okay. Yeah, yeah Silicon Valley started with um, Fairchild Semiconductor. So every single one of these sort of ecosystems starts with some exemplar, someone who's providing the talent pool for the rest, you know, and it's just, it's like watching a tree grow. It's going to be slow and slow. So you take three or four or five years before we really see, uh, notice it and can understand it. It's already happening here in Tampa Bay. So one of the things that we're committed to is really making sure that we are an amazing talent mill, meaning we will, we take so many young students and we bring them through our, our programs and we train them as managers. You know, we really kind of look at ourselves as like a university as well, where we're, we're, you know, we're actually maturing a lot of young talent and we expect them to, you know, some of them to leave and to go out and to do amazing things, to join other startups. 
that does not mean you have any right to call on my people or try and poach them. <laughs> just want to be clear about that, okay? Let us just get there to that point. But, but th I think that's an important thing as well. I just think it'll happen. It will happen. Everything is ripe for it to happen. Everything is in position for it to happen. I will say there's a lot of independent, fractured efforts. And I'm not here to criticize anyone, but I mean, I, when, there, when I realize there's 62 different entrepreneurial uh, uh, organizations that of service in some way, shape, or form, and that they're not connected together and they're not collaborating. We need them to connect and collaborate. And that's why I was excited about Synapse because they're creating an application to online connect all of this together. And I think that's what it's going to take. Yep. We'll just take a few audience questions. So anybody, anyone, anyone has any questions? Yes, who has? Oh gosh, what keeps me up late? I, um, well, since I have uh, stuttered Eastern philosophy, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. Before that, uh, everything. Uh, so I guess I would say, I guess I would say that you have to look at things in the proper perspective, and if you do that, you should be able to sleep at night. The things that do keep me up, like I had a hard time getting sleep last night. I was excited about doing this speech. I get very excited about speaking, so. Not nervous, but excited. And it's kind of like, oh, I want to get up and play that game. You know, I want to be on that baseball diamond or whatever it might be. It's, it's that feeling. Those are the things, excitement keeps me up typically anymore. Yeah. Oni, I have to ask this question. Mm -hmm. You did not talk about swimming across the English Channel. I didn't. I need these people to hear oh. that. Tell us what it was that motivated you to do that. What was some of the things that you really had to do? Because that's not an easy task. You can't just say, yeah, I'm going to swim across the English Channel and just go start swimming. Yeah. So really would yeah. love to hear that. Well, OK. So yeah, so I'm the only person in Tampa that's swum the English Channel. I tried to get that in the Guinness Book of World Records. They said it's not important <laughs> enough. Um, <laughs> but uh, I did that. Well, I mean, first of all, I guess I'd say that when you hit the age of 50, what I did, at least, is I said, let's see, multiply by two. Nope, won't get there. Uh, so that means more than half of my life is over. So what's on the bucket list? I better get going, right? I don't have that much time. So that's what kind of kick-started it. Um, I did like three full Ironmen. You know, you start to try to prove things to yourself. And I was doing it out of complete ego at first. Like, I want to know that I want to know that I could do that. English Channel was different, though, because I had gotten to the point where it wasn't about that. It was about facing fear, uh, truly facing fear. I didn't think I could actually swim the English Channel. I said, that's way too big. There's no way you can pull that off. So try it, right? Um, and so for me, it was about, and, and, and if you talk to the people that have swum the channel, you know, you can practice for it. You can get your body ready for it. That's that takes like two years, but that's mechanical. If you just do these things, your body will be ready. The thing about the English Channel is it's mental. It's 90% mental because that, the French shoreline never comes. Uh, and it's like Methuselah. If you look back at the cliffs of Dover, it's like you turn into a pillar of salt. Uh, you, just, you just cannot, it's such a mental thing. Uh, and so for me, it was how can you overcome not only your body, but your mind's uh, desire to stop you, to make you afraid, to say that's too much for you, okay? Because I don't really believe that. I don't believe that of myself. I don't believe that of any person. I believe that we let our bodies and our minds slow us down more than we really should. So it was really to conquer fear more than anything else. Um, and it was a great way to get in shape at the same time, I suppose. You know? so. Thank you. So one, okay, so, uh, one last question. Sure. Yes. Arne, thanks for a great presentation uh, to kick off this conference. First, I want to share like a personal experience with Arnie this morning. We were, I wasn't sure of how to get to this building, so we got, put in Google, it got us to a different building. We're walking by, Arnie, I think, saw that, and then said, took his car to the side, 
Staff said, are you going to TIE? <laughs> you better go forward and take a right to it. Thank you very much. And it well takes uh, yeah. uh, to help us during that. Mm -hmm. The key question was, when you go from, look back, when you went from startup to more like a growth company, where you took it to $1.2 billion company, what were the key go growth drivers for you? Okay, go ahead. At that stage, going from uh, $10 million to next $10 million. OK. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess it's not. It's. I think this should be a, a refreshing answer, and I think it's the truth, right? If you really put ego aside and you say, what is the real answer? What is the truth on that? The answer is getting up every day and putting in your 20-mile march. Not 10 miles, not 30 miles, but getting up every day and putting in your 20-mile march. Facing your fears, okay? Not letting them stop you. Not making crazy decisions because the competitors did this or the competitors did that, okay? Staying true to your course. Of course, looking at the environment, looking at technology, looking at what you could do better, and then just 1% every day, trying to get a little bit better every day and putting in your time every day. Success is not one of the, and, and I think a great book to read is Great by Choice. So if you really want to understand like my philosophy, or I guess really what I learned, not my philosophy, but what I've inherited was Great by Choice by uh, Jim Collins, right? Great business author and keynote speaker at our event a couple years back. So his whole thing is, and he ha I, had, I always get the opportunity to talk to our keynote speakers, so that's always really cool. We've had Steve Wozniak, you know, we've had Jim Collins, we've had Simon Sinek. You know, uh, we're having uh, Tim Lee's uh, Tim Berners Lee, who is uh, you know the inventor of the of of HTTP or World Wide Web. Uh, but I always get a little nugget or two from them. And you know, I asked him. I said, "Look, you've written all these great books. It's like you know, I don't I don't really know anything that we've ever done other than just be dedicated to the vision and getting up every day and working hard to try and make it happen." And he said, "That's that's all there is." He goes, you're not going to find any really successful entrepreneur who's going to point to the day and time that was that inflection point that let them go to the next level. It's a series of decisions that are made every single day. Uh, so the good news is, you know, it's about what you would hope it would be about. It's not about being, in, I mean, yeah, you want to be in the right place at the right time. That's kind of BS, okay? It's like you can make your own opportunities. If you're paying attention with your eyes wide open about your industry, about your business, Take some risks, okay? Take some risks, small risks. I'll give you everything I learned here at the MBA program. I took an MBA, I got my MBA, I got my undergrad in accounting. I'm a CPA, active CPA, too boring, didn't want to do that the rest of my life. So I went and came here and got an, an MBA in finance. And the one thing that I learned, summary from finance, was this after the MBA. I said to myself, you know, it's really interesting. The world is very adverse to taking on risk. In fact, the world is so adverse to risk that it is willing to, uh, it is, is unwilling to take it. In fact, uh, those who take risk usually get a much higher re rate of return, even if they take a tiny bit of additional risk than the average person. So I committed that I would take a tiny bit more risk than everyone else in the average public, but I would do it from day one, okay? Now, I would tell you that I have, and I don't think I've really ever pushed it any more beyond that, but if you're willing to take just a little bit more risk and then work your plan every day, show up every day, create enthusiasm every day, you're going to end up attracting really great people around you, uh, and you're going to have a very successful, long, sustaining company. Um, and so I guess, you know, I guess that's really the answer that I would give you. It's nothing magic. That's the good news, right? It's also, it's like, oh, crap, I was hoping there was magic so that I could just skip a whole bunch of work. No, there's no shortcut, yeah. Thank you, Arnie, for your words of wisdom. Thank you. <laughs> On behalf of uh, Thai organization, uh, this is heavy. token of appreciation. <laughs> You don't want to open it? You want me to open it? Yeah, okay. Do. Oh, wow. Look at that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. It's very nice of you. Thank you. Thank you, Arnie. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Thanks.